right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And I'm here in lovely, beautiful San Diego. It's a lovely afternoon here. And I'm joined by Chris Wallace, who is in Boston. No, you're not. You're in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, John? Good. Not too far from Boston, so I'm not that far off. No. Yeah. Um, sure and yeah, sure, Flight. And Chris is uh, founder and president of Interview, uh, and he helps with sales consulting, the coaching practice, and and marketing and corporate leadership. Okay, so um, you say one of the reasons why you became uh, and you continue to be an entrepreneur is to help companies better align the strategies of the boardroom with the daily execution on the front line. And one of the ways you do that is by helping people align their brand and their product stories with for customer facing teams to improve customer experience. So mm-hmm. when you mean when you mean brand and product stories, uh, what do you mean? Because what do you mean by the two of those or uh, and the two of them together? So I, I'm gonna give you a I'm gonna give you a great example. I heard yeah. I heard a, an example yesterday talking to a, a partner and a prospective client. And the, the prospective client is in the roofing industry. Okay. Mm-hmm. It is a name you would know. It is, it is a household consumer name. And this is a company that is spending money, investing money to brand themselves to the consumer in many different ways. Advertisements on HGTV, advertisements in in home magazines, um, digital campaigns, all those things. They are a consumer brand and they are telling the consumer, we're going to help you make your home better, your life better in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And this organization goes to market, some their, their sales channel includes contractors. So you have a roofing contractor that shows up at your home. Mm -hmm. And at that instant, that person is your brand. So think about that. Somebody watches a home improvement show on HGTV and this brand, you know, has product placement, it's glorified. And then your experience with that brand and what you think it's going to do for you becomes this contractor who's hauling samples out of the back of his truck. And he's telling you what this product's going to do for you. Or in a lot of cases, not telling you what the product's mm-hmm. going to do for you. What we do is we help marketers bring alignment between those two things. What they're telling the customer directly through marketing and advertising and what they actually experience at the point of customer contact. That's our goal. Yeah, and that's great because uh, you know I've often said that one of the biggest issues that you have is that you will have a, a brand message, you will have a marketing message, but whether it's a distributed uh, contractor force like the one you're just talking about or whether it's even your own internal sales force, too often those marketing messages, brand messages are not really uh, communicated properly and adopted by the very the customer facing people who are often the first major interaction with your brand, right? But yet they're the people who are least helped in order to how to articulate that. It's, it, it's a great point. And, and the, um, the struggle that we find with a lot of organizations and, you know, the, the bigger the consumer brand, the more prevalent some of these challenges are. And what we find is, you just said it so well, um, the people who are responsible for carrying the message are equipped in very different ways to, to deliver that message. And when you're a marketer, you're trying to win the hearts and minds of buyers, right? That's who you mm-hmm. want to win over. But the, the methodologies that companies use to equip their teams to tell these stories is, is just fall short. I mean, that, that it's simply what it comes down to is it falls short. Product training does not help you understand mm-hmm. how to convey a brand vision or a differentiated story when you're standing in front of a customer. Knowing what the, the specs are only takes you so far. You have to put those pieces together. That's where most organizations stop is in the actual synthesizing of that story mm-hmm. They leave yeah. different pieces of information and expect their, their sales team or their customer service team to collect them all and make it their own story. That's where the inconsistency comes in. Yeah, and obviously when, you, when, when that happens, when you leave it to them to, to create their own story, what you get then is a multitude of different variations on a, maybe on a central theme, maybe not, but certainly you're going to have a different experience and hear a different message depending on who you interact with, which is obviously the antithesis of what you're trying to do with the brand. <clears throat> and brands need to care about this now, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you know, again, I'll go back to the, the example in the, in the roofing industry. 
here's where, here's where things have changed. Customer access to information, as we all know, is, is exponentially greater than it was 20 years, 15, 20 mm-hmm. years ago. And even in a decision about buying materials for your roof, most savvy buyers, are going, homeowners, are going to go to your website. Yeah. Okay, They're going to go to your website. And even just that single marketing touch point, if you are conveying one image and one story on that website, and that contractor is not only, and I'm not trying to throw contractors under the sure, bus, that's sure, not sure. my point, but that contractor is not engaged in a way that that contractor has no idea what's on the company's website. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's, that's not their job to know. But marketers can't afford to have the words that they say and the words they communicate on that website be different than the experience the customer gets because the customer is going to be left scratch in their head saying, I could be doing business with any of these companies. If that's what I get when they come into my home, I don't care who they work for. If that's what I get from the brand when they're in my home, that's not who I want to do business with. Yeah, and I think you just uh, you just touched on an important point there is in a situation like that, then it really does reinforce the perception that everything is a commodity, right? And that at the end of the day, uh, one roofing company, another roofing company, like who cares, it's roofing, right? Uh, and the only opportunity that you often get to, and, and there may be huge differences between your products, right? Uh, in terms of quality and all that, but the, uh, the but the one of the few chances that you do get to differentiate is in the interaction, the customer experience of when they interact with a salesperson or a service person or or whomever. So that's absolutely right. For the average marketer, especially in the types of industries that we're talking about, the mm-hmm. average marketer they feel a million miles away from that customer interaction. They feel like that's it, it's it's. It impacts them. We have research that shows 81% of marketers believe that the effectiveness of their role is in, in large part determined by the ability of that frontline person to tell the story. 81% believe they are judged on that person's effectiveness. Mm-hmm. So they can't afford to turn a blind eye to it anymore because that's how they're being judged. What, we're, what my organization does is help them uh, make that gap between the marketing suite and that contractor out, out in the customer's home, we help shrink that gap for them. We help make that a, a closer connection point, help them reach down closer to that point of customer contact and give that person innovate in the way that they support that contractor, or support that frontline person to make sure that that story comes through with more passion and more, and more um, conviction than just sharing a bunch of product information. So how do you how do you do that? How do you close that? Uh, it's almost like that last mile gap. How do you close that? Yeah, we talk about it as the last mile all the time. So you know, the, the first way that we start is we want to understand our audience. And when I say our audience, I'm talking about the internal. I say internal. Mm-hmm. Anybody that's between the marketing organization and the customer, we look mm-hmm. as an internal mechanism. Whether those are partners or employees, frankly, to us, it doesn't really matter. Right. Um, so we look at it uh, through the lens of of data collection. We have a tool that we built called the Brand Transfer Score, and it does exactly what it says it is. We are measuring how effectively an organization is transferring their brand story from one point to the next throughout their organization as it gets closer to the customer. So um, the analogy that people use, it's almost like the game of telephone or the bucket brigade where one person's handing somebody a bucket of water and a little bit spills out. Mm -hmm. By the time it gets to the end, there's no water in the bucket. what we're helping to do is understand where that dilution might be happening, where that's, that leakage is happening. And then we build campaigns to, for lack of a better phrase, market to these internal audiences in very different ways. Um, it's not internal communications. It's not your traditional product training. We're trying to develop influence-based campaigns. Right. They're getting these stories in front of these frontline teams in very different ways. So the best way to run a campaign is to be starting with the data understand what their starting point is, what their perception is, and then build the campaigns to move them from point A to point B, but do it in a fun way. Again, I use the word innovating, but we really are pushing organizations to think differently in the way that they get information out to people. So what are some of those ways that uh, you've encouraged people to get creative and and do that? Because there are so many different ways you can do that nowadays, but uh, what are some of the more creative things that you guys have done? So, so I'll give some specific examples, but I'll start mm-hmm. by saying um, marketing organizations are good at coming up with new and different ways to reach their customers, to activate their brand mm-hmm. externally. 
And we look at them and say, do what you're best at. Market, right. you know, market the product, but market it to a different segment of your pop- population. Mm-hmm. The, one of the, the, probably the cleanest example I can think of is we do work with another building materials. It happens to be one of the categories we work in is building materials. Uh, another major household name, and they have a sales force that calls on their, their independent retailer network. And those dealers have these reps come in every day. And we ask those reps, how do you want to get this information? If a new product is coming out or you know, new brand, you know, change is happening with the brand or a new campaign, how do you want that information? We gathered that detail from them and they told us, no webinars, please. We're sick of product <laughs> training webinars. We're, on, we're out on the road. We want it. We're going from appointment to appointment. Don't chain us to our desks. So what we did was we took very similar information that they would put in a webinar, repurposed it, and packaged it up in a podcast series. Mm-hmm. So now these outside sales reps are consuming this information, hearing a dialogue with their corporate executives as they're going from appointment to appointment. It's on their terms. It's integrated into their day. And oh, by the way, we're showing them, we listened to you. We heard right. you. And we're yeah. serving you this information in a different way. So that's just one example of the types of things we're doing. Yeah, no, that's that's really interesting because, as you said, there's nothing that people you, – you're going to get the opposite result if you drag people into a, a, a medium or force them to go through some format that they're not – either they're not interested in or is time-consuming or it doesn't suit them. So like you said, I mean, you drag them all into a webinar – yeah, they'll show up. Will they engage? Probably not. Will they take anything away from it? Probably not. Um, but if you go and really understand your audience and understand the world that they live in and deliver your messages in ways that works for them, then you'll get the opposite impact, right? You'll get more engagement than you would normally. We, we live in a, in a net promoter score world. For, for those, right. that, you know, for you and your listeners, yeah. you know, if, if you're not familiar, you've probably been asked this question a million times. How likely are you to recommend this product or service to a friend or family mm-hmm. member? That's what yeah. NPS is all built off of. And what we're saying is NPS has uncovered how important that word of mouth, you know, really the currency of that word of mouth recommendation is. What we're trying to understand is before you even get to that point, what is the person who actually works for you, who represents your brand? What are they likely to say? How are they nice. going to get, how are you going to influence them to the point where they are passionately and advocating for your brand in that customer conversation, as opposed to, uh, well, they give us all this stuff, but we never look at it. Or, you know, they just give us a bunch of product. Here's a catalog, right? That type of thing. That's not enabling people to, mm-hmm. to exchange information and spread it. It's just sort of shutting it down. So we look at it as in an NPS world, well, let's focus on the people that are one step upstream and make sure that they're influenced and they're bought in. Yeah, because I think, again, you touched on a really good point there is that inadvertently sometimes that that can be communicated, you know, internal dysfunction can be communicated to the customer or the divisions within it. Or as you said, like if if somebody on the front line is going, um, yeah, here, let's not send you this thing that marketing did for me. It's It's got some interesting stuff in it. Maybe you'll find it interesting, but it's clear from the way I'm communicating that I don't find it useful at all. Um, and I'm communicating that out, and that's not that doesn't build confidence on the on behalf of the buyer into your organization, does it? I mean, it, it may sometimes people think that it makes them more friendly to the prospect, but in fact, all it does is make the prospect doubt the organization behind you. That's really well said. Confidence is the key word, right? Um, how can you know? We we talk about as an organization, we help our clients, you know, spread belief, confidence, and pride. If we can mm-hmm. get somebody to believe in it, be confident in it and have pride in it, that's going to influence the way that they, they act and the way they represent your brand. And that's a high bar, but it is what we strive for to, you know, to help our clients reach. And I'll give you another example. Yeah. I'm in the process of, of buying an automobile, okay? Mm-hmm. And you can imagine in that process, and you're talking about big brands that yeah. advertise mm-hmm. during the Super Bowl. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I'm going in to look at these vehicles, and you get exactly what you just heard. Well, you know, I'm supposed, you know, they tell me I'm supposed to take you through this booklet, but it's okay. Well, you, all you did was just, you just destroyed. You talk about misalignment. Your Super Bowl ad told me how amazing this completely redesigned 2020 model is. And I show up and you're complaining about what your sales manager tells you to do. That's not projecting confidence in the brand. Yeah. And I was thinking, I was thinking cars are, um, automobiles are a very good example now of, um, 
like because when I go to do automobile purchases or whatever now, I start the whole process through email and it drives them crazy. Drives yeah. them absolutely crazy. They're always saying, Yeah, but could you could maybe could you come in this evening and we can sit down and have a chat? And I'm like, No, I can't. Uh, I said you could just simply answer the questions I sent to you and then and then by the time I've got all the questions answered, then I'm ready to come in and it's a much smoother process. But it's like sometimes you're fighting with them to engage with you in the way that you want to be engaged with. And I think that the, the auto buying experience is one that most people can relate to. Mm, yeah. But when you start to take that same mentality and you spread it across, spread it out across a lot of other categories and, and, and different, um, yeah. uh, different verticals, um, the same concepts apply. The companies that are going to find a way to impact that customer experience are the ones yeah. that are going to avoid commoditization. Yeah. Um, when we do sessions with clients, I, I always ask my, my favorite question to ask is, who in here has ever shopped at a Nordstrom? And you know, two thirds right. of the hands go up. And then they say, who's ever gone into a Nordstrom and left spending less money than you thought you were going to spend? No hands go up. Okay. Right. People want to buy things. They want to buy from brands that they care about and they trust. It's not a matter of whether or not they want to spend. It's do, are they going? They're going to spend it with the people that they trust. And by the way, they're going to spend more with the brands and they tr- with the, that they trust than they even budgeted for. So that's what every brand should. Sh- and they can say, "Oh, well, that's high fashion." Every listen, uh, department stores are as big a commodity as any any uh, any provider out there. So avoiding commodity so, avoiding commoditization really is about finding ways to build in that experience. Yeah, and, and absolutely. And but the the most important thing, and this is um, you know where we started this conversation. The most important thing, though, is that there is a uniform experience and that there's a uniform message. Because it's no good, even if your salesperson, no good, even if your salesperson has the great, has got the message down pat, has got the is fantastic, can deliver a fantastic experience, all of that during the buying process. But then it's let down in the implementation process or the customer service process or some other part lets it down because that drags down the whole because customer experience can only be taken in totality. It's not segmented. Absolutely true. We, um, in the work that we do, um, every single customer facing audience is, is, uh, is, is, that's our audience. That's the group that we work with. So we have a, a, a current client right now that's in consumer services and they have, salespeople, they have customer service reps, and they have technicians. And every single one of those is a discrete customer touch mm-hmm. point. And, yep. you know, customer service can answer the phone and sales can go out and every one of them can do their job. But when the technician gets to the door, if the technician doesn't do their job, then the perception of the brand goes down. So anybody who interacts with the customer is a brand representative in our opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, Chris, uh, this has been great. All of Chris's information will be in his contributor bio. But before we go, uh, if you want to tell people just a little bit more about yourself and how they can find out more about you and your company. Sure, sure. You know, like John said, company is Interview, and that's I-N-N-E-R-V-I-E-W. Uh, you alluded to it in a comment earlier. It's almost like, you know, we're asking organizations to take that inward look at their organization. Mm-hmm. So Interview Group. Dot com is our website. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, active on, on social media, my, uh, my LinkedIn. Uh, so you'll find Chris Wallace. There's many Chris Wallaces, but I'm in Philadelphia. So you, you should right. find me there. And um, those are the best ways, to find, best ways to find me. You can also, through the website, you can find contact forms. Fantastic. And as I said, all of the information will be in Chris's uh, contributor bio. So my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. Thanks for joining us. See you all for another expert interview really soon.